Sacros? Why Sacros? It sounds like some Greek island. I think I'll stick to Sacros. Oh dear me, I'm terribly sorry. And this San Duke, it's been on sale for nine years. Can thousands of people be wrong about its controversial looks? Should you care? Why? Let's find out, shall we? Nissan. Hi! Oh, uh, Mr. Franks, we've got a problem, sir. You've, you've got a problem. I've got a problem. It's a... Uh, yes, sir. It's... Wonderful. Yes, I know. It's wonderful. It's a diesel, sir. Uh, right. Um, well, this is uh, one of the most popular cars in its class, and uh, this one looks particularly nice in yellow. We'll have to review it anyway. So, uh, anyway. <clears throat> Nis Nissan. With anxious time, us do what we're Call home, even if the sight of it has not yet touched our eyes. And here we are, and we're together, even if we are apart. And we're together when we're together. Something big is happening among us. It's not as if we don't have to deal with So, welcome to another episode of Tweed Jacket Reviews. Um, today, we are in Hampshire, and I'm very grateful to uh, Carol for letting us drive her. 2017 Nissan Juke 1.5 DCI in connector. So thanks Carol. Farrell. So before we get into the detail um, of this wonderful and controversial car, can I please ask you to subscribe to the channel, to like this video and to leave a comment below. It all helps out very much. The Nissan Juke was first introduced all the way back in 2010 and it's pretty much made a name for itself as the best-selling small crossover. Before the Duke came along, there weren't many cars in this class at all, but now there are absolutely hundreds of the things. It seems like they launch a new one every week. This particular car is a 1.5 diesel. It's got about 115 horsepower. The engines available in the Nissan Duke um, are mainly petrol but of course there is this diesel as well. Um, this range starts with a 94 horsepower 1.6 which is available also as an automatic with 117 horsepower. There's also a 1.2 turbo petrol with 115 horsepower. There is a 1.6 turbo petrol with 190, 214 or 218 horsepower depending on how ridiculously sporty you want to get and the top power outputs but to 1.6 turbo ones are also available with four-wheel drive and an automatic gearbox although why you want either four-wheel drive or a CVT automatic in this car is beyond me. The Duke was facelifted all the way back in 2014 and this is a 2017 car so this does have the facelifted sort of improvements such as clearer instruments and um, a slightly nicer exterior as well as a bigger boot. However, the car is about to be replaced and as a measure of cost cutting, the car is currently only available with this engine and the 1.6 litre petrol with 115 horsepower. It's worth saying that you don't need to order your Duke in this wonderful shade of yellow, but if you're the sort of person who really likes to stand out, then that might be totally appropriate for you anyway. So if you um, avoid the base level trim, you can have this um, driving mode selector here, which it goes through sort of uh, economy and sport and normal. Most of the time, people would leave this in economy mode to get the best economy, particularly in this diesel, although the sport mode really does sharpen up the throttle response. And um, when we were coming up a slip road earlier on, I had it in um, economy mode, the car was very, very sluggish. So if you're doing any kind of overtaking, I would really urge you to use that so that you don't get caught short. For such a tall car, the, the 
Duke does hold the road quite well. Um, I don't know if the Renault underpinnings help with that particularly or not, I'm not really sure. Um, but the body control seems very taut. The steering is actually quite well weighted, particularly if you put it in sport mode because that does sharpen things up a bit. And um, the car grips very nicely. I wouldn't say this is a sporty drive, but it's certainly not as vague and horrible as some tall, small cars I've actually driven in the past. Some of the things you notice when driving this car is that the handbrake's quite awkwardly positioned, and uh, sometimes I felt that man touching might have to be involved um, when I've been pulling the handbrake on next to Mr. Franks today, which is obviously not so good. Um, the gear change feels very nice though, it's quite slick. One thing I'm not really sure about in this car is the fuel economy. Now this is the 1.5 diesel and I imagine it gets around 50 miles per gallon, but I couldn't really say because I'm not sure I had a work trip computer in here. Um, although my preference if I had to have any Duke would to be buy one of the recently discontinued 1.2 petrols, which has the same power output as this, but probably has a little bit more of a kind of sporty characteristic to the engine. In terms of justification, this being the end connector model, this has sat nav, climate control, cruise control, and a reversing camera. Obviously, there are more premium trim levels than this, and there are more basic ones. This is a nice mid range compromise. The car isn't actually as bad to drive as I thought it would be. It's actually pretty good. I mean, some of the interior is not to my taste, but anyway, let, let's, let's stop talking about that and let's go and have a look in the boot and be sensible for once. When this car first came out, it was criticized for the size of the boot. This one's a bit better because it's a post facelift car and it's 354 liters. Now that's not as big as sort of like a Volkswagen T-Cross or anything like that, but at the time it was not too bad. Under here we haven't got a spare wheel, we've just got a tyre repair kit and you know how much I don't like those, but it's par for the course really these days. Um, the four wheel drive versions of this car only have a 207 litre boot, which is barely adequate for stuff, but of course you can just fold these rear seats. Right then, well let's use this funny door handle to open it up and let's see if I can get in behind myself. Right, now that I've moved the seat forward a bit I can get in. I'm not particularly tall at 5 foot 11 and if you've got a shorter driver it's not really going to be a problem but for some people the rear of this car is going to be a bit restricted. So um, headroom is actually okay, knee room as you saw earlier isn't great if that's my driving position. There's no armrest in the back of here. You can fold the rear seats, um, but there's nothing else in here. There's no USB ports or um, rear vents or anything like that. Overall, it just feels a bit claustrophobic, really, or despite this raised roof, you'd think there'd be a bit more space in here, but sadly, there isn't. So in terms of the cabin materials, this is hard plastic. Doesn't feel too bad quality, though. This door pulls okay. Um, nice bit of glossy trim here. But this car is starting to show its sort of French origins a bit because this is based on the same platform as the Renault Clio. And um, this is the sort of interior quarter I'd expect for one of those as opposed to a small crossover. So we have got Isofix um, in here, which is good. Seat fabric doesn't feel too bad particularly. Um, yeah, there's not a lot else to say apart from the fact that I need to get out of here now. Are things better in the front? Well, let's see. The glove box, that's okay. I'm not sure it's any good for secret mission documents though. The heater and ventilation controls are really strange because they're actually shared with the dynamic driving modes of the car. And these dials, well, they, they feel terrible. There's no other word to say than that, but I suppose you get used to it after a while. In terms of visibility, well, um, the rear window is quite small, so I'm grateful for the reversing camera on this particular car. The um, 
front is an interesting story because the top of these headlights mean that you can see the corners of a car much more easily than in most modern cars. But it does make the car feel quite big on country roads. One thing I've noticed about this particular car is that the interior quality is very consistent. It's the same as in the back. And um, there is a bit of soft touch material on top of the dials here, but the rest of it's quite hard. Now, if this was a traditional off-roader, you'd be quite grateful for that. The quality doesn't seem too bad, but these days I think you do need a few soft touch plastics for a car of this price. In terms of storage, you've got this armrest in the middle. Got two cup holders there. Got a little sort of mat in front of the gear stick here. Um, got some rather large door pockets as well. Um, it's not too bad, it's not the worst I've seen, but uh, some cars are better. So I referred earlier to the fact that the heating and ventilation controls and the controls for changing the dynamic mode on the driving, they're actually the same. So D mode here, we've got Eco, Normal and Sport. I've been driving it normally in Eco mode, although if you're accelerating up to um, a motorway slip road, you're going to need to put it in Sport because that saps a lot of the power. Um, as I've said, these dials are not, are not great, they don't feel too good. The design of this isn't too bad, but the screen at the top of her dashboard is small and the buttons just feel a little bit cheap to me. The um, instruments are quite nicely laid out, although one of the things that belies the age of this car is the fact that right in the middle of the speedometer and rev counter, we've got this tiny little orange screen. It looks like something from a computer game a handheld from the 1980s that's uh, quite small and difficult to read. This particular car's got satellite navigation. Um, I think this is the end connected trim level. Um, we've got Bluetooth, we've got CD and AUX. In fact, the car's got quite a few um, sort of ports here. We've got USB and AUX there. Then satellite navigation. Um, the map's quite small. It looks quite dated and um, I'm not sure how accurate this information would be when you have traffic. In terms of the position for the driver, it does feel quite comfortable. I've got plenty of adjustment in the seat and the steering wheel. The gear shift is in a nice ergonomic place. It doesn't feel too bad at all. This sort of weird motorcycle fuel tank effect though is a little bit unusual. I don't know if I really like it or not. Apart from that though, this steering wheel, which looks like it's out of a newer Nissan, um, is nice to hold and all these buttons feel fine. So then, what do I think of this somewhat controversial small crossover? Nissan Duke's not really a car for those who are shrinking violets. It's more like a Mini or a Fiat 500 in that respect. It's not really to my taste, but I can see the appeal. The only problem is, is that the small crossover market since this car was launched is now so crowded and so talented you're going to have to be somebody who really is extrovert to want to have something like this. Oh, <laughs> excuse me. Terribly sorry. And they say video games aren't any good for you. Thank you for watching this episode of Tweed Jacket Reviews. My name is Joseph Lloyd. I'm an independent vehicle consultant. I find cars for people. Please uh, subscribe to the channel if you'd like to do that. Don't forget to like this video and leave a comment below. If you wish me to source a car for you, I'd love to do that. My website is www.lloydvehicleconsulting.co.uk. Please use the contact me page on my website to get in touch. I've got a Facebook page as well. It's facebook.com forward slash Lloyd Vehicle Consulting. Thank you. Ew.